The Lord's saying, this is the time like Lot. He said, Lot's wife looked back. The church is looking back. The church is looking at the wrong places, wrong people. He says, I gave you a destination. It's the city on the hill. It's a place where no man can take you. No reward greater. He says, your salvation is the key to your life. He says, you are not of this world. Don't look back. He says, there will be many pillars of salt in this time. We'll see the flood. We'll see the flood of people falling into the traps. He says, this, t- this is the time. I'm shaking the church and waking it. He says, this is the time. I've spoken to many. Few have called back. They've missed their calling. But the Lord said, the faithful ones, the faithful ones will finish the race. Father, bless this place, this house. Give us the word tonight. Let it go around the world in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I like I like hearing from God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Richard. You're not tired anymore, are you? (laughs) Praise God. Well, I gotta clean my palate. I know this is kind of rude, but we're we're getting recorded. In the last few weeks, we've been uh, teaching on how the Parsha reading starts in the beginning of Genesis and it finishes the the year with the month of Elul, which is time of repentance. It starts off with the word, as Kimberly was teaching about Bereshit, the beginning, the word, has to do with the Son of God, literally the word of God coming from the Son of God that was spoken into us, breathed into our lungs to... Make us operate. It is, that's how we were created. And at the end of the year, which is the month we're in, a little, is, is sincerely a time of repentance. Most people don't have a concept of what repentance is. So as we're teaching, we're teaching we started teaching on angels, and the Lord said, you know, we're going to get into deliverance. Well, with bottom line deliverance, it starts with your salvation. And we're going to continue that teaching because there's... A lot of people think they're saved. We got a lot of mental Christians out there. And if we can kind of shred some of those myths around them, hopefully their eyes will open up. Because the majority of the church right now is dysfunctional. And the reason it's dysfunctional is not functioning in the kingdom. They're a person of the kingdom. They're born of the kingdom, but they're not functioning in in the kingdom. Everything in Hebrew has a name, has a purpose. So there's a function to who you are. And so God brought you here for this time. So as as we were in worship, the Lord was showing me about the time of Lot. A lot of people have strange feelings about Lot. And, you know, if you get into some of the commentaries about Lot, he was actually supposed to be an evangelist that got off track. You know, he came out with Abraham. He understood who the God, the creator, uh, the heavens, the earth were. He knew that Abraham was following the correct God. And then he got, ended up in Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> Vegas. And not everything that goes on in Vegas stays in Vegas. And so as he got out, his wife turned about to look. And there was something there in her soul that tied her back to that place in time. And she lost it. And this is where... You know, we use the word kosher, kodesh. We're separate, holy. I mean, we're talk- we are not of this place. So these things that we're talking about, we have to literally reprogram ourselves in our soul and our spirit so we can operate. This, this, is, this is a hideous time. We're seeing things happen that are so hideous. And the threats that come at us right now, terrorist threats, are the lowest forms of threat because they're they're attacking the most vulnerable people, the defenseless people. They do, and they use it's psychological warfare because your mind isn't trained 
to operate in faith, it operates sincerely in fear. Most folks without Christ are living in fear. I don't care how rich or poor they are, how strong physically they are, they are in fear. They're in fear, period. Without Christ, there is no hope. So that fear-based mentality is out there. And so we have a whole generation. I, we talked about this before since 1948. We, we saw a shifting from the gospel being preached to a form of socialism being released. Because in 1948, the World Council of Churches got together with the UN and said something like, hey, the war's over. Let's help everybody. Let's not talk about Jesus. You know, Jesus is a nice guy. He's over there. We just want your money. Because it's kind of funny. All the nations that worship God had money. What a quinky dink. They were blessed. And so here comes these connivers. Sneaky folk. Undermining the church system. The one thing that we had above everything was salvation. When we lost it to a new generation. Where I was watching this thing the other night on John Lennon. Ooh, you know. Shoot Oko, shoot Oko. Nothing, no problem. But what happened was they got, they got off in the wrong direction. And they dragged the whole generation down the tubes. The mantra of rock and roll, you know, one of the, one of the things that got them in trouble, they said, you know, rock and roll will be bigger than Jesus. No. 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 Because the sins of rock and roll are being exposed. And so the, the, the flesh needs, those things that are out there, we have to sh shift. This is such a serious time we're in. And so what we've been teaching on salvation, teaching on deliverance, goes hand in hand. And we're going to get more into it because uh, actually, if you ever listen to what I teach, it's actually a series upon series upon series upon series. I've got to go back and start labeling some of these series because it's been some good teaching and preaching. Let's go to... Uh, the partial reading, Deuteronomy 23.10. And it's kind of funny because we're in Deuteronomy 23.10 and, and it, we, we, we're talking about blessing and curses. and you know, Everybody wants to be blessed. Nobody wants to be cursed. But there's, there's a point where you get to choose who you are. Are you going to be blessed or are you going to be cursed? And I, I'm talking, this can be any people group, any time, period. And then we, we get into the prophetic side of this, when the God, God gives us words, you know, there, there are certain relationships. Uh, we had a situation last week, we prayed for something, the Lord gave us an immediate answer. And so God does do resolution for you. You don't have to get in a combative state with everybody around you that you don't like. All right, because he, he knows your hearts and your desires, but you just have to do it right. In Deuteronomy 23.10, uh, let's start with... Uh, Verse 9, when you go out as an army against your enemies, you shall keep yourself from every evil thing. Deuteronomy uh, 23, 9, in the verse 10, if there's among you any man who is unclean because of a nocturnal emission, we're not going to talk about that part, <laughs> that he must go outside of the camp that he must, and may not re-enter. When we start seeing this, the translations are different. I, I, I'm telling you, when you look at different translations, it's different. One of the translations says, When a camp goes out against your enemies, you shall keep yourselves from any evil manner. Matter. M-A-T-T-E-R. When a camp goes out against your enemies, you shall keep yourselves from any evil matter. In the New Testament, it talks about being a soldier, not being entangled in worldly affairs. Now, in the Old Testament, we were talking about the corporate army. You know, in the New Testament, it doesn't talk about army, uh, soldiers. It talks about soldier, singular, you. In the Old Testament, it's always a corporate group. But as a congregation, we're affected by what comes in the sanctuary. Yes. Now, there are people... Climbing the ladder, trying to get themselves clean, and there's people sliding down the ladders, getting dirtier. 
And sometimes you can't tell which way they're going. Seriously. Yeah. Seriously. So, you know, as a congregation, you know, we pray for you. We pray for different folks in here. And uh, when, we, when we started teaching on sin back in February, we lost a bunch of folk. Does that mean? <laughs> you know? But see, that, that separates you from God. So in this, we start understanding when, when we're battling in the, in the Old Testament, if you came back from battle and there was something wrong with you, you got wounded or there was blood on your hands, they would leave you outside the camp for a period of time. It was minimum one week, you'd be quarantined because the battle damages, you know, uh, what do they call it now when somebody goes to war, they get the, uh, yeah, postpartum just disorder. Those things actually have been going on for a long time, but they would sit outside the camp and confess these sins and they would wash themselves and they would get themselves functioning again. They wouldn't just go right back in the camp. So when, you know, people want to, well, I'm in sin, uh, I just repent and I'm back in here. I'm going to be, no, 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 no. There's a point in time where you have to get yourself back in the saddle, but it has to be on a, on a clear conscience. The other thing is when you see in the Old Testament, in, especially when they were in, in the wilderness, if somebody in the camp was in sin, it would affect the whole camp. And this is why people in ministry have to have clean hands all the time. And so you don't want to be real quick to lay hands on certain people because if they're in sin, you don't want that on you. Right. You know, and, and, and this is where we start dealing with the Jezebel spirit and we're not going to talk about her today. So the question today, are you battling with dirty hands? See, dirty hands will hold you back. You may think you got a grip on something, but it's going to contaminate it. It actually may pull you back into it. So we got to be careful about how we battle. And we have to understand something here is that as we're battling these kind of battles, will your soul be identified with the breakthrough that you're trying to achieve? Or is your soul going to be identified by your sins? Here you are struggling with the problem and you can't give it up. Is the problem bigger than your salvation? Is the problem bigger than your trust with God? Are you embarrassed to confess? And you don't have to confess to me. Confess to the Lord. Talk to him sometime. He has a phone. His GPS. He knows where you're at. God's positioning your service. So this, this timing is, as we're battling, make sure your hands are clean, and then are you being identified with a past sin? I was talking to a, a, a I forget who it was, they had gone to a church, and they, they just got saved or something, and they met this lady at this church, and she was telling everybody she met about the affair that she had a couple years ago. And it was an ongoing thing. She kept telling people, and, and it's like, well, that's, that, that shouldn't be your crowning victory. If your testimony is still, you're bringing this thing up, it's probably hurting your husband and stuff. Because she was married. It was, it was like, what a knucklehead thing. When I heard that, it's like, what kind of testimony is that? Some of the stuff, once it's been forgiven, leave it under the rug. You don't go back there. You don't advertise what an idiot you were at that time. Well, I was a Christian. I got in sin. Look what God did. And I'm still back in, you know, I'm talking about it. And she lost her testimony to somebody who was becoming a Christian. Just a baby Christian. I was, I was so amazed when I heard that story. So, we want to understand where you're at in your salvation. Is it incomplete? Are you recognizing the past more than you're recognizing the future? Or is it complete? What, where are you in your salvation? And there's different levels of the salvation we're, talk, we're going to be talking about. Because we want to do battle in a righteous state. We're covered by the blood. We haven't ran away from the blood. We're, not under, we're, we're still under it. We're not, we're not trying to do something in our will, our strength. But we have a righteousness based on the fact that he's clothing us for this battle. 
So our mindset is needs that we need to be in Christ with Christ as we were in the service today. Praise God. So as we're in Christ with Christ, we have a better chance of restoring those things that are broken in our lives. We're not battling out of our own strength. So what happens is people have themselves a brokenness in them and they're trying to fix themselves in the spirit, but they haven't been redeemed in that area. They're trying to stand on a broken leg. They're trying to lift up something that they can't lift up in their own will or their strength. And they believe that maybe some kind of spiritual, you know, thorn in my side I got, so I'm going to just be this way. No, that God wants you healed completely. You, you may have something that's affecting you, something you did in the past that may come back at you. You know, God forgives, people don't. Right? Yeah. And we got a whole nation of broken marriages and people and families. And so when we're dealing with children and, 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 and whatever, don't expect everybody to be hunky dory just because you got saved. So those, that's just a reality check. So we battle in a righteous state because we are in right standing with Him. We also are covered by His righteousness. If we understand the boundaries that the scripture gives us in those areas that we need to fight, we're not going to go off the cliff. We're not going to run off and do something that we cannot handle. We'll be able to stay within a boundary, a covering that Christ has given us so we can go forward. Most folks don't understand where God stops and where God starts. And so in your salvation, there, you have to understand your scripture. The Old Testament only had the Scripture. When we get into the New Testament, we start seeing the whole shifting, but the early church knew what the boundaries were based on the fact that they had an incomplete salvation. When Christ came, they had a completed salvation, so they, they understood the boundaries. See, in the Old Testament, they had to stay within the Scripture to maintain their salvation. Because if they got out of that, they got into their own idol worship or self-worship or just flat out sin but we want to stay in a righteous state and we, we have to understand there's two natures we're dealing with here there's a sin nature that we got from Adam and when the second Adam came we have a new nature it's called a salvation nature it's a righteous nature but, but our old nature is better shape is, is, is in the shape of our sin nature and we have to get into the salvation shape. We have to start getting those things out of our system that hold us back from the breakthrough. Let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. Oh, my Bible. That's what, what was kind of great the other day. We, were, uh, we had water baptisms. And um, Jamal, remember a couple years ago when the Muslim kids showed up to the water baptism? Well, we did water baptisms and we had a Muslim family watching us get dunk. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. We just pray for them that they get saved. They were sitting, we're in the pool and here comes the white robes. Kind of scared some folk. Hebrews chapter 2, 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation after all at the first spoken through the word, through the, excuse me, through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. Your salvation is your great escape. You're escaping an entire sin nature planet that was contaminated by Adam's fall and your flesh was birthed into the sin nature and then your, your spirit came into this place where you cannot control anything other than accept Christ. Once you accept Christ, then you, you turn 180 and you walk away from all those things. You detach yourself from the sin nature and you start walking into a righteous nature and you grow up. 
Well, there are a lot of people that look good on the outside, but on the inside they're, they're, they're cancerous, religious, rotten folk. And so we don't want to have become a hypocrite, and we see that a lot when Paul was dealing with a lot of the religious people because they thought they had some form of salvation based on a religious act or self-promotion in a community. That's the problem with the church right now. People can go to church and they're not never contested or their, their faith or their salvation is never tested to the level where people know that they're actually saved. Well, we don't want to go there. We don't want to offend anybody. We're not trying to offend you. We're trying to get you out of the mud. You're drowning. You're, you need help. The broken people out there are broken because nobody's been honest with them. They, people don't want to hear this. So we want to escape that sin nature and move into a salvation nature. A righteous nature. A righteous state. The kingdom is at hand. When Christ came and said that, they had a religious system that was failing. The people were under slavery of a oppressed, for, you know, the Roman government. They was just killing and doing whatever they want. And they thought they had something. He came at the most opportune time to bring the cross. If he came during a peaceful time and everything, nobody would have seen it. The tragedy and the trauma of civilization will bring many people to Christ. I believe the end time is going to be a fast acceleration. I was watching a prophecy last night in Hebrew a little caption. It was talking about uh, the Colossus. Does anybody know about the Colossus? The statue of the... Uh, well, the Colossus actually fell at one point. It had been built at, because it was a victory. And they were going to re... I didn't know this about the history of it. The Colossus was going to be a statue. They were going to put it in front of the Suez Canal. And it was going to be a Muslim lady. And they took that and they said, no, 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 no. We're going to turn it into the Statue of Liberty. There's two prophecies in the Bible that kind of coincide, but we read it as, a, you know, the ten nations and the toes, and we, we read into all this stuff, but hey, no, it's about a statue falling and another statue falling. And so this rabbi in Israel in 2005 really went into detail explaining how in prophecy that this statue is going to fall again, and he, and he pointed it straight at the Empire State Building, or, or excuse me, the Statue of Liberty. That's scary. This is going to be on our land. No place on this planet will be free from any kind of persecution. It's an antichrist spirit. If you have Christ in you, it will come after you. If you don't have Christ in you, you've already been sucked into it and you don't even know you're drowning. So we neglect our salvation by never entering or challenging ourselves to enter into a complete salvation. Are you saying my salvation is incomplete? No, I'm saying there's more out there. There's more that you can receive from Christ. We're putting limits on Christ on our salvation. Well, I'm a good person. Hey, you know what? Nice guys finish last. There are things that you have to set boundaries with people. You, I tell people you can love them, but you don't have to live, live with them. Amen. You can forgive them. You don't have to live with them. Let's go to Ephesians 3, 17 and 18. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, and, so, and know that the love of Christ, which surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled up to the fullness of God. Paul is challenging us to check our roots. Our salvation is vast. There's so many opportunities in our salvation that we are passing up. He says that... The, that our salvation is conclusive and it's inclusive. Everything's been finished. You just have to include it into your life. You have to include Christ in every aspect of your life so your salvation can be full. That the, the root, the ground, 
where we're at, those things come from repentance and it's rooted in love. It's not on your sloppy, goppy love for each other. You know, it's really your true love to God. If you have a true love for God, it doesn't matter what you think about other people, you'll just love them anyway. To the point where, you know what? It doesn't hurt me helping that person anymore. You know, they used to drive me crazy. No, you know, I, you just be nice to them. Because you got Christ in them. You're bigger than they are. Sometimes you have to take the higher ground. Some people you have to just cut out completely because you know they're not going to change and they're hurting people around you. That's why ministry is becoming so hard nowadays because you don't know who comes in the door. You know, I mean, we've dealt... I, in, 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 I'm not going to go into details. You know, we, we've had we've had people we've had to deal with that have had drug problems, alcohol problems, um, all sorts of problems we don't want to talk about. And so that kind of issue, when it comes into the church, I don't know how, but it always gets to me. I find out, and I'm not trying to judge anybody. They need to clean up. They need to walk away from it. They need to grow up. They need to grow, grow into their salvation. So when we realize how much God loves us, then that depth, the breadth, the length, you start, comprehend, you start comprehending your salvation. The purpose of your salvation. You've been transformed from one king under the devil into a new kingdom under God where those things are unlimited. We start walking by faith because we're in a new kingdom. We don't know the map of the kingdom yet. How far and which direction do we walk in Christ so we can achieve things? We're limited by our sin, our soul, and our past. So the opportunities in Christ is always there. Salvation is just not being forgiven. Well, oh, I got saved. I've been forgiven. That's just the first step. There's different levels of your, of your salvation. We're going to get into that. But the, the, just the comprehension of understanding this, I'm forgiven. Well, that's just his side towards you. This is where we're talking about repentance, breaking curses, accepting the blessing. We have to turn the tables on the devil so we can get the right side. We've been on the wrong side too long. Let's go to... Uh, Psalm 78. In Psalm 78, verse 20 and 21, we start seeing what the children of Israel in the desert and some of the things they were dealing with. And here they are being completely de delivered out of Egypt. They're in a transitional place called the desert. And behold, he struck the rock. Am I in the right place? Yeah. Yes. Behold, he struck the rock so that the waters gushed out and the streams were overflowing. Can he, give, can he give bread also? Will he provide meat for his people? Therefore the, therefore the Lord heard and was full of wrath and kindled against, uh, against Jacob and angered against the mounted, uh, against, angered also mounted against Israel. Here they are watching their deliverance being completely taken care of for up to 40 years in the desert and they're still questioning him. And they start bringing a wrath. They start bringing a wrath against themselves. God starts getting mad. He's seeing it. And we do this in our salvation where we, we all of a sudden, well, yeah, I got saved, but I'm going to go back in my sin nature. I liked it over there. You just start doing stupid stuff. And then they start blaming God on things. And he's act, we're actually hindering God's in our, God's, God in our life. And we don't respect. First of all, they didn't believe him. They didn't believe he was God. So when you come out of a culture where there's multiple gods, you start picking and choosing the attribute of the God you want. No, he is the God above all gods. That angered him. God's salvation was everything. God gave them 
complete salvation when they were in the desert. They no lack, no need. Their shoes never wore out. They, there was no sick. But there was a generation lost in the desert because they did not believe in him. They turned their hearts back. So the salvation that God gives us is every blessing, every protection, all grace, healing, breaking of all curses, and everything supernatural is from him. Everything is supernatural. There's nothing above him supernaturally. Well, something demonic happened. Well, that was demonic. That's in between here and God, and we have authority over it. The supernatural things start happening when you start trusting God beyond what you see in your sin. When you start trusting God that there's something greater than your sin. When you start trusting God through the cross, the righteousness, and then you break through past your sin. Now, when we're born again, we are spirits renewed, but we're still dealing with the soul and the flesh. Well, once saved, always saved. These people were delivered out of Egypt, and they did not have a complete salvation. They didn't make it in the promised land. Did they go back to Egypt? No, they didn't go back to Egypt. The salvation is always total provision. Total provision. We, well, we're faith people. We believe in this. We believe in that. Yes, but if you're in sin, certain things won't be reproduce or produce for you. Well, I sowed a seed. Well, it was with dirty hands. Well, I had to dig in that soil. No, you just have to give the seed to God. He will plant it. And this is where I come across Christians that get stuck in business deals. I've been scammed myself where people come in and they have some kind of big, big thing for God and they scam, they fleece the congregation. Those kind of folks. And God can't bless them. And usually something bad happens to them after a while too. I don't know, you ever notice that? So don't get involved in stupid things. Let's go down to verse 41. And again, and again, they tempted God and painted and pained the Holy One of Israel. They pained God. You guys want to imagine where they were painting him at? Okay. God, they pain God. Because he wanted to give them more. He wanted, he wanted the complete package. He wanted the complete blessing. He wanted to release everything for them. Remember, it was an 11-day walk. It took them 40 years. And a whole generation was lost in the desert. We have to retrain this generation to get out of the desert quickly because when things start happening it's going to be the power of God that's going to release people the confession understanding who Christ is understanding what they're dealing with demonically this politically correct stuff has to leave has to leave it's killing the church we have to the diversity of our ministry here is just a blessing because you know what diversity does it keeps us honest and we're all here for one purpose, is to support, understand who Christ Jesus is, Yeshua the Messiah. And his time is soon. It's coming quick. And so we need to be prepared. If I can prepare you, that's my job. I want to prepare you. But they, they grieve God by limiting him. They limited God. That's what, that's what was painting him. Well, you know, I believe God, but... Uh, but this is that's not God's business. And this is you, you see stuff that's going on in the church. They're saying there there are, are there are churches that I hate to say it. There's gay churches out there. There there are churches out there, and this is where our walk has to be cleaned up. Let me tell you something. And I'm not I'm not getting on anybody. And uh, we got a clean house here. I don't have to worry about any of you. In the old days, people got married by the time they're 20, 25 years old. That cut out a lot of garbage real quick. Seriously. And you, you get a family, you get a job, you get work, you have kids, and you just keep growing. And that was really good. We have this whole generation of limbo where people are in their 40s still trying to find themselves. 
<laughs> yeah, I'll have to remember that one. Okay, everybody's awake. But they're trying to find themselves. Well, you know, this is where we need to have the camaraderie of marriage. We need to have the unity in the family. These things. And it needs to be restored ASAP. Because there's so many people out there. My, my friend, had, uh, he passed away. And they're not going to watch this. So I'm going to say, <laughs> their kids are in Colorado. They moved to Colorado when the, their youngest daughter was in high school. Dude. Why would, why would you move your kids to college? Well, you know, we got opportunity. And their family, everybody, dude. You know, they're in Colorado. Right. Making brownies. <laughs> they tempted God. It grieved him. You set limits on God based on your soul and your sin nature. You have a salvation nature God has given you a whole new kingdom and you're still thinking under your sin nature and your flesh nature so you're you're limiting God based on the fact that you're still tied to a sin someplace when you were born again you were completely delivered into a new kingdom and you had to learn to cut off the past cut off the flesh those things that are holding you in the world that really don't mean anything to God other than it grieves him Let's turn to Hebrews 14, or, or 10, 14. And the more you understand your salvation, guess what happens? A lot of these curses start getting broken off you. A lot of the stuff you thought was a curse has no hold on you. You were just in a holding pattern based on the wrong mindset, and you have to shift your mindset to a victory mindset. Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering, he has perfected for all times those who are sanctified. And that word there, sanctified, is being sanctified. It's an ongoing process that he's sanctifying you. You're born again, but he, there's a process where you're going to step away from that. You're going to step away from this. You're going to step away from that. You're going to find yourself completely detached from your past. Well, you know, people find Jesus a lot when they're in jail. Did you ever notice that? <laughs> they realize, oh, uh, you know, I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to do that again. Once they're out of jail, they may still have that reputation. And you have to have a, some fortitude understanding that Christ has forgiven you and the love of God. And so, because people can't, can't forgive you like God can and a lot of times they get out and they feel rejected and they fall right back in that trap. We do the same thing and we've never been to prison. We're feeling rejected by our friends. Well, they used to like me before I was a Christian. They don't like you now? Pray for them. Pray that they get saved. Open their eyes, God. Send somebody to them. Praise God. You can't, you can't save everybody. The one sacrifice was perfected. It was a perfect sacrifice. And then when he was done, see in the Old Testament, the, the priest would have to stand and sacrifice every year. We're going to do another sin offering, another sin offering. It was an ongoing thing because they were waiting for the Messiah. When he came, Jesus completed the task, com complete sacrifice, complete propitiation. That's what the, the Yom Kippur is coming up. We, we understand that we completely have been redeemed. And then he sat down. That was it. There's nothing more he can do. It's your mindset on how you view things and how you tie things back into your salvation that shouldn't be there. You have to let go of the past in a lot of areas. A lot of the things you, you, you've put value on really has no value anymore. And some of the things that are broken, you don't need anymore either. You don't need to go back and, you know, God fix my mess. No, that's going to work at all. He sat down so nothing else can be done. It was completely completed. Completely complete. And that word shalom, we see that word shalom in Hebrew, everything in its place, nothing missing. Complete peace. Complete peace. Well, I'm praying for my kids. I'm praying for my kids. 
uh, and you have to trust God that he's going to deal with them because the promises are you and your house will be saved. Those things that are spoken into the word, the written word, will not return void. And your trust has to go to a higher level. You cannot function what you see is going on around you. You may be a thousand miles, five miles, whatever. You have to trust that God's dealing with those people. It's also that the Christ's sacrifice is a continuing sacrifice. It's never going to run out. And it's constantly sanctifying you and re-sanctifying you as you reposition yourself closer and closer to him. This is why we use the term a Christ-centered life because most of the folks are not even close to it. We taught years ago about the outer circle, inner circle like a bolt a target. You know, the, here's, here we are in the uh, outside, you know, the inner circle, God's perfect will. The next circle out is God's permissive will. And the next circle out is God's unpermitted will. And we bounce in between permissive, where God's just like, oh man, don't do that again. To unpermitted, where I'm not looking at you now. And see, your insurance runs out when you're doing stupid stuff. You know, and when you're doing your barbecue inside your house. Years, years ago, we had a neighbor, before I moved into my house in North Scottsdale, this guy was a, a French chef. I was like, ooh, French chef. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's not kosher. He had, he had one restaurant. I had six at the time. And I drove by and I saw his house. And then when we, when we moved in, his house was gone. <laughs> he... He sold his business, took the money from his business, paid off his house, had a big party, and barbecued in the backyard, set his house on fire. <laughs> and did not have the insurance to cover it. Oh, no. I had the insurance. But that's our lives. We do everything. We spend our whole life building up to something stupid. And then we think we cash in and we just fall down on our face and we really don't have anything. Where were we? <laughs> it's, it's a continuing sacrifice and that we're continually being sanctified to a new level. What we're doing is just getting the garbage out of our yards. We're just cleaning ourselves up. We're understanding the, the, rela the relationship we have with Christ. How important it is. The Old Testament sin sacrifice was, was had to be renewed over and over and over. We see it started with Isaac and Abraham. And this is why we have the Abrahamic covenant. And it gets to the point where God puts Christ, his son, on the cross. And we have one sacrifice. It's complete. It is finished. Remember when he was on the cross, he said it, was, it is finished? It's perfectly finished. That word in Greek is perfectly finished. So that the, the new birth we're dealing with, that we're born again, is a whole different experience that a lot of people don't really understand. We think, well, I got born again, I got baptized in the water. Hey, you know what? The other day we did baptism. I, did, I didn't understand what I was doing at the time. I did not understand. And we have to regenerate this generation. We have to teach them the basics of the gospel. There's a pastor in Iran right now, and he's sentenced to death. And now, they're going to put it with uh, more death. They're going to say sentences for spreading propaganda, the gospel, to destroy the world. This is what they're calling the gospel, propaganda. We are not infidels, and this is not propaganda. We wrote, the, the scriptures came... 550 years before this monster was born, the moon goddess, they still have that crescent in their, in their flags. These people are demonically inspired. It's the god of this world driving them as hard as they can. And if that's not politically correct, in England, I read an article where kids are being kidnapped, dragged into... Sharia law communities where the Sharia law is being practiced, the parents go get the kids back 
And they're getting in trouble because they're breaking the Sharia law because they're saying that these kids volunteered. These are young kids under 15, 14 years old being raped. And they're being kidnapped and their parents get in trouble for breaking Sharia law. God's law is going to break them. The law of sin will not last. God's going to stand up to some, some of these people and I, I believe there was, there was a, some idiot... He was, he was on, on, on the internet, he was Iraqi, and he was showing his nine-year-old bride. Did you see that? He got killed. Praise God. So this, the, the new birth, that born again experience, let's go to John 1. Ah, don't get me started. Oh, this is, this is we're watching... The Bible being un unraveled right before our eyes. We're in John chapter 1. Verse 9 through 13. Ah, this is what I like. There was the true light. I like that. Praise God. I wasn't, I wasn't planning on reading that originally, but when I saw it, I remembered. There was the true light. He is the light. Which, coming into the world enlightens every man. Praise God. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. That was you before you accepted Christ as your Savior. He came to his own and, and those who were his own did not receive him. Verse 12, that as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the, the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Your born again experience is beyond anything you can comprehend. When you're born again, it's a simple faith message where you're saying, you know what, I'm, I, I know there has to be something better than this. There's something out there beyond what I see. The tormenting that I have has to release me. And as you accept Christ, you get this big breath of fresh air. Well, you just don't take one breath. You have to continuously breathe in that new spirit daily and increase yourself in Christ. That resurrection power is continuously moving on, coming into you, and that you have these expectations God's going to do something. So when we're praying for people, we, we, we cannot fear and we cannot give up. What God gives us is the right to become a son of God, which what Adam was in the, in the beginning. So we become, I don't want to, we become a sinless person but we still have to get rid of our old nature. Nature is a habit. We fall into these habits. So we want to get rid of these, these sin natures, these thought processes. You know, well, I'm not pretty enough. I'm not tall enough. I, I don't speak well enough. These things that we condemn ourselves with are because our, our sin nature turns on us. So when, we're in our, when we're in our world, it's like, oh, we're so cool. We're in sin. We got all this great stuff going on. It's sin. Yeah. Yeah. And that sin, nobody caught that. <laughs> that, that sin feels so good. <laughs> and then you realize, when you look back after you get born again, you're going, <laughs> that, was, that was wrong. But we still have that craving for sin. Jesus, Jesus used the expression like a dog returning to his vomit. Right, right. How nasty is that? And that's what we do continuously. But the problem is the churches never get out of their sin nature while they're in salvation. Nobody's teaching this and we're drowning because we don't know how to swim away from it. He gives us the right to become a son of God and let's go to Ephesians 2.8 I'm going to wrap it up real quick. Ephesians 2.8 We see in Ephesians 2.8 By grace we are saved. Your initial contact with God is by grace. He sets it up where you can receive Ephesians 2.8 
For by grace you have been saved through faith, not that of yourselves, it was a gift from God. In the beginning, when you heard about Jesus and you accepted Jesus, that's all you needed. After you accepted him, now you got a responsibility. And so when we're caring over people, and our loved ones, our children, those people that we've prayed for, and they're, they're going faltering back between God and not believing God, that's between them and God. And I'm telling you, God is dealing with them. And the problem is, is the church, the system, is not telling them, hey, look, you're stuck in this cycle of salvation. You think you have something, but your grace is going to run out. They're, 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 they're not grown up. Paul deals with that a lot when he starts talking about the, the milk of the word. So by grace you're, you're saved. Let's go to um, Titus 3, 5. In Titus, is, it talks not by works. We, we see a system of once you're saved, you've got to get yourself built up, cleaned up, filled up. Titus 3, 5. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing and the regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit. Once you're saved, then you've got to grow up. You've got to get cleaned up. You've got to start following out what he's doing. You have to participate in the kingdom. Remember last week I was teaching on camaraderie, that the, if you're not in fellowship, you're a liar. Oh, I don't need to go to church. We, that's why the churches are falling apart. They're lying. They've been taught that, hey, we can, you can do your own thing as long as you're a good person, you pray every day. We have to have a congregation. Congregations keep you accountable. They reciprocate. God blesses you. There's the things that need to happen in the teaching, in the form of teaching. Not just an entertainment center for you to go every week where your kids get babysat. That's what a lot of, hey, I, you know, that's why the Mormon church is so popular. 1 Corinthians 1, 18. I'm, I'm trying to move along here. I, I, I guess I got on a ramp. I thought I had it covered. 1 Corinthians 1. Verse 18. For the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolish, foolishness, but to those who are being saved is the power of God. We have to remember that we're being saved to get us to the next level. We have to look back and say, hey, you know what? I'm not there anymore, but I'm not here anymore. We have to keep walking in the right direction. So we have to remember the cross so we can continue to move. So this, this salvation that we're seeing is a continuing salvation where we're repossessing ourselves closer to God. Luke 8 35 and 36 and we see we see something here where we're talking about salvation and then we start realizing that the salvation we talk about also delivers us from the demonic verse 8 35 through 36 this is a story of the demoniac and as we see this, and the people went out to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and they found the man who was, whom the demons had gone out, sitting down at the feet of Jesus, clothed, and was in the right mind, and they became frightened. Why would they become frightened if they were in the guys in the right mind? And those, had, had, and those who had seen it reported it to them how the man was demonically possessed, had been made well. The Greek word there is sozo. Has to do with salvation, healing. In the Old Testament, you start finding out a lot of the words they were using in the Old Testament had to do with salvation, was a completeness. So the curses are broken. The curses are broken. The curses are broken. So our salvation, the demonic stuff that's attacking you, the curses that you think you're falling under, they're already broken. You have to realize that you have the power here and here. You have to believe in your heart, God, and you've got to speak and denounce. We accept Christ, 
with our mouth. We publicly confess him and we believe in our heart. The demonic stuff, the curses, have to be broken by your mouth and denounce them out of your heart. They do not have an attachment to me any longer. My culture, my family, my own sin no longer has any ties to my heart. I've confessed in the Christ. I've repented. I've turned away. I broke them off. I'm going to walk in the blood, the righteousness of Christ. Amen. When is this going to start happening back in the church? It's happening here. Amen. It's happening here. And this cleaning up has to go on because the revival that's going to come is like as Lot's wife is running, she turns. And guess what? People are going to start seeing that. People are going to start seeing Lot's wife, and they're going to see her turn. And they're going, I don't want to be like that. They're going to run past her. And God's going to give that grace moment where people can get saved, and those things will be broken off. This end time challenge is not about how perfect you can be. It's how perfect he is and how much you can count on him and understand his support and what's going on. If you, if you tur keep turning back to a religious state of mind, you will drown. You will drown. We are going to get, it's going to get in a critical phase. What's happening now around the world, it's going to accelerate. And the church has to start moving faster. And if they're not preaching true salvation understanding of the God of creation, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, understanding the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the power of God, those things that are essential, we're going to fail. The next six weeks, this is critical time, guys. Whatever happens next week, you know what? We're protected. If we get a short trip to the mountain, praise God. You know what? There's, there's going to be some sad people out there. You haven't witnessed to them. It's your job. You're the ambassador. You have to witness to other folk. You have the word for them. If you care about them, you say something. Yeah, I've been talking to my boys about it. You know, and it's like, hey, they know better. There's a point where they, everybody's going to be held accountable. And God is dealing with every person on this planet. There's, uh, there's nobody I, I meet that's not rattled right now. It's going to get worse. Are you ready? Are you in the right position? Are you in right standing? Or are you trying to battle with dirty hands? See, the thing is, when you're battling with dirty hands, they'll see you're dirty. And they want to they want to appreciate salvation. We want to have a clean heart, clean mind, clean body. That's why he says, you are the temple. Father, we just praise you that this is a temple here. As we pray... We ask, Father, not only you forgive us, Father, but show us those things that we need to release so we can get more of you. We ask, Father, that you give us that positioning in Christ that we can understand your word so we can translate it, we can communicate it to others about the salvation and the hope in Christ. Father, let this uh, congregation be a soul-winning congregation. Father, let this congregation be a miracle-walking congregation that as salvation happens, that the curses are broken off, that you have aligned angels around this place, you have given us the power and authority, that you have given us the great commission, you have given us the blood of Christ himself for this end time to overcome all the blood of the world, all the sins of man. Open their eyes, Father, let them receive Christ in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Praise God.